Everyone, welcome to episode 16 of This Valorant Life. Uh, thanks for joining Adam and myself today. We're going to be diving into the mailbag episode. We're super excited about this. So thanks for sending in all of your questions. Uh, we're going to jump in to the first one, which is from Takeo. I hope you're pronouncing your name correctly. I'm going to read out the first one and Adam's going to jump in. So Takeo says, what are your opinions on monitor view distance? Some pros play with the monitors inches from their face. Some are more normal. Is there any advantage to having it closer or angled? The, the moment I, he asked this question, uh, Adam, I think of Redgar. Oh my when, God. When he, like when you, he's like. <laughs> he like, literally like, sniffs uh, the pickles, pixels. He looks like he's in a torture device uh, <laughs> that is causing him to play Valorant for some reason. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this because it seems like, um, yeah, the angle piece and the closeness um, what what have you found important about that? And and maybe why do you think some of the pros are playing like so close? Yeah, so I've done a lot of experimentation myself, probably just because I'm a gear coper. Like I like to cope on a lot of stuff. Um, the general guidelines that people say is like, you know, arms width away, um, like monitor at like eye level or something like that, or like middle of the monitor at your eye level, something like that. And it's like straight on, like that's like your ergonomic stuff. I've tried it. That's actually currently what I'm yeah. using now. Um, but yeah. to kind of get into the other stuff, like the weird angles and like the really close up stuff, I think number one, being really close up kind of lets you dial in more. Like I've noticed it makes mm. me just stare at my crosshair. So like anything that pops up on my screen in that little center zone, I'm going to be really focused on it. And I think it actually helps with opping. Uh, probably not for your eye health, okay. but you know, for reaction time, it might be a little bit better. Okay. What about the angle because like i see that a lot where like um net comes to mind from g2 like when you see the the webcam of him like the the <laughs> it looks like he's on a tablet you know like it's almost like he's about to write on it like he's like right on top of the thing like um why do you think the the looking down aspect is uh is helping or not helping yeah so my assumption on that i haven't tried too much on like that straight down approach maybe it's because like you said they're used to tablets my other assumption would be because they like to lean forward maybe like i've seen uh there's players mm. like king king and calm that have also similar sitting style with their monitors um and i imagine they sit a little bit like hunched over so you can kind of just it's a little Got bit it. more natural they're kind of like how players tilt their keyboards i think the monitor tilt just goes more and more based on how much you hunch over so i see so it's kind of more you think maybe they're just more trying to match their natural hunchback of Notre Dame posture. <laughs> like, you know, cause, cause, and, and maybe there, there's a distinction here. I think, um, I was talking to Ryan, he's, he's the performance coach now for fanatic, eventually, hopefully a future, uh, podcast, uh, guest. Um, but he coached hundred T last year. And he was saying that like, there's a difference between if you are competing at the highest level, it's all about comfort. Do what makes you comfortable, perform uh, at the best level that you can. But when you're at home and you're practicing, you should probably be leaning more towards ergonomics, like the thing that will help you play without pain and uh, without um, causing problems for yourself longer. And then if you need to like be unhealthy and like do the full like car, like like then you do that for like the competition and then probably not for right. practice. Um, I had one more comment on the monitor thing. I wonder if it's also because they're just limited in space. Cause like, um, obviously having the monitor closer to you, like, I wonder if they pile their keyboard under it and their mouse pad, like sl slightly behind the monitor just to be like very concise. Yeah. I could see that being like a limitation of their setup and that's how they've gotten into it. Um, but if anyone's new starting out to playing Valorant, I don't, I probably wouldn't recommend anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think the slight angle to your keyboard is like pretty ergonomic, like the 90 degree angle. Sometimes you see guys, I don't, I think that was, that's like, that's probably like a mechanism they created because they started playing and it had a monitor stand and they couldn't like get their keyboard in a proper position. And it, it's like less than ideal. Okay. Next question from Takeo is what are some general principles to follow when anti-stratting a team mid game? Or perhaps a better way to put this is how do you alter your own or your team's playstyle on the fly to counter an enemy team's playstyle? For example, in a ranked game, the enemy team is doing something that wins them the round, pushing out off sites on defense, winning duels, playing passive with strong retake. What would be the correct response slash counter to each scenario? Let me just start off the question with, let's talk about like the general thought process. 
because I think it'll probably be too much to be like, hey, when it's A, you do B, right? So let's say, um, you know, let's say guys are pushing out of sights on defense and you're getting rolled on offense. Like, how do you think about responding to that? Because I feel like in most games, especially when you're getting rolled, the response is to stop calming and to stop trying anything. Okay, so to answer, I guess, the first part of that is like, if you're just getting rolled, you got to do anything you can to get around. So I don't care if it means like buying a judge, sending in a corner. I don't care if it's like buying an op and just, you know, whatever you can do to get the kill. You, you got to stop the momentum somehow. So you can play as cringe as you want, you know, solve that first. When when things are going badly, it's not, you know, they call like football or soccer, like the beautiful game. When when you're getting rolled and there's no way you can get around, it's time for some jail valve. <laughs> yes. It's time for like whatever, whatever you can. You like it's, a, it's not time for pretty yay style Valorant where you're like, you know, clean. It's time for some like grungy, ratty. <laughs> yes. Anything you Valorant. can do to win. You know, even if you have to use your five ultimate to win around, you got to do it. Yeah. Um, with terms of like anti stratting, I mean, just being aware of what they're doing in the first place is important. So he mentioned something about like, you know, if they're rushing or pushing out of sights, like if you die to it once, fine. But if you die to it like three times in a row, like now it's your fault, you know? So when I think of like anti stratting in general, I'm just trying to read on players' tendencies and then just looking to call something around that. So if someone's fast rotating, I'm going to call to do a fake. You know, it's like pretty straightforward. You don't have to overthink it. Just notice something and then call around it. That's that's pretty much as straightforward as it can get. And that's the same. It applies for tournaments as well. You notice a tendency, you try to call around it, and then you just <clears throat> try to exploit the gap. That's the main thing. I, I think the other part of this too is that there's a real tendency to have this really um, big gap between how you would think if you were them versus how you feel from your position. They're pushing out on defense and they're just rolling you and yet i know that when i push out on defense i often get shot in the back because there's just some lurker sitting in some ratty corner that i didn't check right and so i think there's almost an element of when it feels like you can't win or can't make an impact i think it's helpful to just be like hey if i was in that guy's position okay i'm doing this play what's going to make me really uncomfortable or what's going to make me really not want to do this again then do that you know because you know that your util always never works as well as their util works for some reason. And I think it's putting yourself in their position, like really putting on that hat and then thinking about how would I make this bad for me? And I, I think it's because I think we get caught in that mindset. Yeah. I, I Just to riff off of that real quick, I think by putting yourself in their shoes, you can kind of let the ego stop. Because I know, for example, in like when I play games and someone's just, for example, running down mid and I'm losing to them, I will often answer with my ego, oh, they're running down mid, I'm also going to run down mid and kill them. Yeah, the okay. ego response is a very, I think, instinctual one. Like you're kind of trying to protect yourself. Yeah. So by putting yourself in their shoes, you can try to be a little bit more annoying, like you're saying. And that's definitely something I have to do better yeah. in my game instead of just being like, oh, let me just fight them. Next question from TKO is, do you ever feel that some ranked games just feel doomed? <laughs> Not in the sense that your teammates are toxic or, or anything, but instead, your entire team is just getting aim diffed or outplayed. In games that feel hopeless, how can you find value in this situation or adjust your strategies? So, I mean, there's just going to be a percentage of games that no matter what you do, you're going to lose. So I think you just have to accept that, number one. Um, number two, I would say, is, you know, if your teammates are actually calming, then maybe you can try to come up with some type of, like, you know, weird strategy together. Oh, let's five stack this round or let's five man flank this round. Just like throw all logic out of the reason, like window, sorry, and just play with your team and see what happens. If they're not playing together, then that you can just chalk that game up to a loss, but you can try to think it, about it more as like a learning environment. So you can try out some new peaks or new angles, or maybe, you know, if you really wanted to try your ult this one time, but it's like objectively int, you could try to do that. Like for example, if I'm playing raise mm -hmm. and I wanted to try my ult from tiles, into cat or cat into tiles vice versa you know that's probably not a good ult but if the game's going that way you can try it and see if it's actually good so limit test a little bit in those type of games this is borrowed from coach curtis and coach nathan uh from the broken by concept podcast which is the idea of like the 30 40 30 right which is like 30 percent of your games are unwinnable it doesn't matter what you do um on the other side there's 30 percent of your games that are like you couldn't lose it if you tried you know some games you just get carried 
some games you get an AFK on the opposite team, right? Like you just win a lot of games just by default. It's that 40% in the middle that you have agency over. So like the game you're talking about, like it happens, you know, like your teammates are having a bad day. You're having a bad day. There's no way you can win. Um, it's those games that are the 13, 11 games, the games that you lost 11, 13, probably like two decisions from being a win, right? It's like those games that you can focus on and, and, and really, uh, uh, min max that will help you not focusing on these ones. And I think your advice is perfect. Use these games as like a testing environment. Like the moment it feels like this time to just start playing kind of crazy. Try the things that you wouldn't actually feel comfortable trying in, in a close game. Take that crazy peek, make this, try a crazy trap play. Um, do that weird eco round, you know, play with some yes, chaos. Yes. The more random, the better in those type of games. So that's, those are the questions from Takeo. Uh, the next one is Moises. Uh, Moises is asking, my question is how important do you think high monitor Hertz is in reaching the top ranks in Valorant? And is it necessary? Number one, it is not necessary. There's people that have done it, got into Radiant with 60 Hertz, so it's possible but it's a huge crutch, right? Um, one of my old teammates, current teammates, actually, I don't know if they're teammates anymore, but whatever, he uh, had like the hashtag 60 hertz in his name, and he was one of the really early, radi early Radiant players that actually got to Radiant playing on 60 hertz. So no, it's possible. Um, it's very difficult. I think 144 hertz is really, really nice to play on, and going from 60 to 144 is super good. Anything past that, you can kind of get diminishing results. So for the majority of players, if you get to 144 hertz, you're you're looking pretty. Um, I will say, like case study wise, one of the clients I'm working with now, he was using 144 hertz monitor, and he recently upgraded to, I believe, a 240. Um, and mm -hmm. he went from like on the AimLab Voltaic benchmarks, he was like immortal complete, upgraded his monitor, and almost nearly instantly got radiant complete. So. I think for like the top echelon of players, like those small differences you can notice, but until you're at that point, it's probably not noticeable. Cause again, 144 to 240 or 144 to 360 probably isn't that much of a difference. It isn't a huge difference. Like 60, 144, 60 to 144 is a huge change. It's like a marginal benefit to go from, uh, uh, 240 to 360. That being said, you know, I, I have like the ACES PGQ a27 the 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 360 one uh with umb and it's great it feels great uh, it hasn't made me a better player because i'm not a good player you know i think it's kind of not dissimilar to like people are like oh you take steroids and you get jacked like we're not advocating for that uh that's a very serious thing to to, to, to consider for yourself but if you take steroids you have to do like a ton of work to make them work for you like doing the thing doesn't necessarily get you there. But if you are already have that crazy work ethic and you take care of steroids, like, yeah, you're going to have great results. And I, and maybe that's a terrible analogy, but <laughs> for Valorant, like if you do the work and you're in that top echelon, yeah, like performance increases, uh, a better mouse, you know, um, better monitor, better FPS that have less, less frame drops, like that's all going to help, but it's not going to make you fundamentally better if you're not great already. Exactly. Yeah, it gives you a slight edge. And by slight, it is kind of slight. Anything past 144, of course. Next, I've got I like pizza. Hey, I've got two questions. First, how much does ping affect gameplay? I play on EMEA, EMEA, and I have at best 60 to usually 70 ping. And sometimes I'm coping that my ping lost me this or that, especially in deathmatch. So ping is a very hot topic. I think a lot of people cope around it. Um, you will be able to get high rank even with high ping, but it is a thousand percent a disadvantage, but it's not as much of a cope as you think it is. So similar to the monitor uh, discussion, I think as long as you're not like 120 plus, you could probably climb. And maybe the biggest experience for me is like there are EU players that will play on NA servers and they have a hundred plus ping, like 120 plus, and they completely dominate uh immortal ranks you know like maybe they're not high high radiant but you will at least see them like in immortal three lobbies doing pretty well so it's possible it's not that much of a hindrance if you're already a good player it's you know annoying at best but you can still do well um so yeah i wouldn't use it as a cope it's just annoying but yeah not a cope uh second question 
I feel like I get way too tilted in deathmatch, more than in actual competitive play. My rule is start a game after I get more than 30 kills in a DM, but sometimes I get so tilted from getting shot in the back and so on. Any tips on how to lose that tilt? Well, um, I guess if you're getting tilted in a deathmatch, you probably haven't had any experience playing other games where deathmatches aren't serious. Your goal is never to win a deathmatch um, unless like you're, I don't know, trying to fulfill some type of quota for some reason. For example, in CSGO, which is the background I come from when I played TAC FPS, uh, deathmatch, you just hop in, play, and then leave whenever you want. There's no winner, right? It's just an ongoing thing that the servers run for 24-7. So try to think about deathmatch like that instead, is you're just getting in there to get some practice, and then you're getting out to, to whatever. So like counting your kills and stuff like that probably isn't beneficial for you. The deathmatch matchmaking system, like some games you're probably playing against really high-ranked players. Some players you might be playing against really bad players. It's just... It's going to vary. So the games that you do get 30 kills uh, in this example, maybe you're playing against a bunch of silvers and then the games where you're just getting destroyed, it might just be diamonds or up, you know? So just understand that there's variance there and going for kills or winning the death match, in my opinion, I don't think should be the goal. If, if you are trying to do something like that, maybe a better way to warm up would be playing in the range. And then like, at least the environment is isolated. So you could be going for certain scores on medium or hard bots or maybe a certain time frame on the Eliminate 50 or Eliminate 100. Because I think that's a lot more reasonable than Deathmatch. I think you hit it uh, on the head. Um, and honestly, Dopeye or Adam has has videos on this. So go watch his warm-up video. I'm sure we can put that in the link. Um, but I think the problem is, is like you're probably focusing on the wrong thing. What is warm-up supposed to do? It's supposed to help you prepare for your game. If you're trying to get 30 kills in a DM, you're probably playing with sound on. You might be peeking corners on sound cues and, and you're getting kills that you wouldn't get in a game, right? Um, and you might be playing ratty in a way that you don't play in a game because you don't get like these easy kills and that's not the way you're going to warm up well. So I feel like warming up with intention, like what are you trying to do? Is it is it the range so you can just get into rhythm? Is it is it just working on your peaking? You know, I think going into a DM is great. But the kills is the wrong metric. It should be, am I, do I feel like my peaking technique is consistent? Do I feel like my crosshair is, is my crosshair placement is good? Uh, is my click timing good? Like, what are you working on and warming up that works for you? Focusing on that. And when you feel that, you'll know it. And then you queue up the game, right? The, the 30 kills, I feel like that's what's tilting you. Like, you've set the wrong metric. Or the wrong metric is tilting you because it's causing you to play uh, deathmatch in a way that's not actually the beneficial for you to warm up. Completely agree. Next question from Jai. How can someone get the motivation to play ranked? For me, it is mainly to do with, I hate playing solo queue because it is mentally draining after like two to three games since I IGL. And if I have a bad day, it is usually a losing day. Man, this one's a very hard one. Motivation to play ranked. You need to understand what, why you're playing the game. Like, are you trying to get a rank? Are you trying to get better? Is it both? Like, do you actually enjoy playing the game? If you do enjoy playing the game, what parts of the game do you like to enjoy? Like, I think a lot of self-awareness is very important here. If you're playing ranked and you hate playing it because it's mentally draining because you IGL, well, why are you IGLing in the first place? You know, like that's, that's my first question. Is it because you want to win? Well, if you're getting exhausted and you, you have no motivation to play, it's not going to serve you long term, right? So maybe adjusting how you play the game mm -hmm. or approach the games and how you show up in the games is very important. Um, not everyone can IGL. Maybe you need to take a more lax approach to the IGL. I guess my question for that would be, are you micromanaging your teammates? Because I would be exhausted if I find micromanage my teammates. You know, maybe you should just create simpler plans. Let's just go A or let's go B or can we rotate back here? Like you can still IGL and have solid mid-round calls or anything like that without having to hard IGL. And if you're still getting tired from those simple calls, then I mean, you might just be a no-commer. Like you might want to be like a no-com jet player or something. Yeah, not not to say, yeah, that's good, but. And I think the, the other thing I have is like, this is a game at the end of the day. You, you've got a lot of choices with how to spend your time. Um, if you don't have a reason to play, then, then I think that's a question of why you're playing, right? Um, some people play because they really want to improve and they want to achieve a rank. And, and I think that's like a really positive motivation. Um, but I think sometimes people play just to get a win and feel good about the day. Um, that's hard because you don't win 50% of your games. Like the game is designed on a rank queue 
Like, unless you're Zekin or Demon One, in which case you're not writing to us, right? Because we've got no answers for you. So unless you're those people, the ranked queue is is made that you're going to lose 50% of your games on average uh, because it's pretty good at figuring out what your level is. It's pretty good at figuring out what a team is. And so if that's going to make or break your day, then half of the time you're going to be happy and half the time you're going to be pretty sad. And and I, I would say that like that feels like a pretty crappy way to experience a pretty fun game um, and probably not the way you would enjoy spending your time if you got to choose for yourself, right? Like if you were just like sitting on your shoulder and deciding what to do with your time. So I think the bigger question is here, what's the motivation to play is starts with what are your goals? Like what's important to you and, and making a decision from there. Um, because I wouldn't want you to be spending hours and hours or months of time uh, playing this game if it's like fundamentally taking life away from you, you know? Yeah, and just to speak from a little bit of my experience, I'm currently on like a pretty big hiatus from Valorant. I was playing every single day on stream and it was just not not very fun. And I found that the answer for me was just to not stream and to play less. And ultimately I've felt a lot better around it. So just, I guess, be okay with giving up the game if that's really the answer. Danny1218, um, could you talk about how sleep and eating affects performance? I've always wondered about that and never found a good breakdown on YouTube. We've got a video on this one. Uh, we can link it in the description as well. Um, have, a, have a watch of that video, uh, our podcast. And if you have questions, like feel free to ping me or Adam, uh, comment section or in our email and we'll respond. Uh, but I think we did a pretty good job covering it on, on that episode. So I'm gonna jump to the next one, which is uh, from Noobs Unleashed. What would you recommend trying if your team is getting mega rolled on attack? Like if everyone is just taking 1vx fights and dying, what do you try doing? You could try rushing first, right? If they're insta-dying, you could be next to them also insta-dying, or maybe you get the trade and you can make something uh, out of it. Um, if that's still not working, you could take the spike and go QB sneak and plant on the other site and then try to win a 1v5 post plant. That's always do doable. Um, it's better than, you know, all everyone separa separating and just dying one by one. So yeah, I would do either or. I would say, you know, I think the question under your question is that when when this game is happening, this is when the whole team goes no comp. They stop comming about econ. Like some people are buying, some people are saving. No one's, you know, no one's coordinating smokes. You know, I think there's this like huge momentum piece to Valorant, and you're probably not going to win this game. But the one thing I think you can use this as an opportunity to train is like just your mindset and ability to be like hey when things feel a little bit hopeless i can still i'm a pro in this of doing the things that will help us possibly win even when the the situation feels like it doesn't work i'm still going to call for smokes i'm still going to make a call for a play i'm still going to try to have some idea i'm going to call out outs i'm going to still try to coordinate econ like if you can do that when things are hard then you'll be able to do it when things are easy and if you do that as a habit, it's probably going to impact your games positively in the long term. Like how many game, how many rounds have we lost? Just because we didn't look at alts. Like we we could have known easily that that KJ alt is going to make their retake super easy, and we just needed to be a little proactive. But literally, we didn't look. Right. I think this is an opportunity to make the best of what you can. I like that. I like this name. The because who doesn't like breakfast? The king of breakfast. Two four seven two. As someone who had almost 2,000 hours in the game and is still stuck in the gold to plat range, welcome to my life, man. Uh, I am finding it difficult to stay motivated to grind for a higher rank. What are some things you guys do when you go on major loss streaks or it feels like your shots just aren't hitting? So maybe I want to touch on the 2,000 hours. I'm kind of curious if that's 2,000 competitive hours. Is that 2,000 hours in deathmatch? Like, how's the split there? Um, just, just because I think that's important. Um, and then the second thing, I guess, there is also if you have a lot of playtime, I wonder like maybe if, you know, it is time for like a FPS, like look at your setup, like are you playing on like 10 FPS? Are you playing, like, is, are there like gear limitations? Because there are gear limitations and we touched on the monitor hertz thing earlier. So just to kind of look at that, because I think I do think it's a little bit abnormal. Say if you had 2000 playtime hours in comp, then it might be a gear limitation. Um, but to answer the question of major loss streaks, that's a hard one. It's very, there's this quote, and I don't know, I'm going to butcher it, but it goes something like, 
uh, when you're winning, you're not as good as you think you are. And when you're losing, you, you're not as bad as you think you are. Something like that. So that's what yep. I would think about here. If you're going on a major loss streak, like, you know, it's okay. It sucks. But try to go back to the basics, go back to the fundamentals, like look at your matches. Are you losing a lot of gun duels because you aren't warming up? Are you losing a lot of gun duels because you're tilted? Is it a combination? Like just go back to the basics, revisit it and try to make sure you're polished on those things first. Like, are you are you buying properly? Are you ulting properly? Like those things. Um, and I guess that answer is kind of the follow up question, which with the are your your shots just aren't hitting. Like for me, when I'm in that slump, I go overdrive into my mechanics training. I'll play like 10 to 20 death matches a day, like no joke. And then within a few days or a week, I feel like I'm back. I feel like I'm, you know, refreshed. I'm new, like my mental is better. And I think like, but just by putting in that work, I can have confidence in my own gameplay and kind of know that I can win duels. So two things come to mind for me. So I'm going to assume, uh, King of Breakfast, that you already have this goal of reaching, let's say, Ascendant. And you're you're really excited and motivated about that goal. I think the, the the other part here is, you know, it's really unhelpful to focus on outcomes. Like I gotta go in this game and win it. Like that's a real sure way not to win a game, right? Like can you imagine like uh feeling like you're hitting the you've you've been given the ball for a game winning shot and you feel like your life will end if you don't hit that shot? That's like probably not a great mindset to be in. I think this is where process goals are really helpful over outcome goals. You know, the outcome goals is like, I want to win the game and get 30 kills. You can't really control that. But a process goal is like, well, I'm going to reset every round mentally and focus. or I'm going to check econ every round, or I'm going to focus on making sure I'm really happy with my peaks every round, like focus on something you really can control. And if you can do that, you would say, okay, I won the game, even if I didn't actually win the game. Because over time, you do those things and improve on those things, you will win more games, right? And the other part of it is that sometimes when things feels hope, things feel hopeless, it feels like it doesn't matter what you do. But the reality of the game is that the, the result of the game is the sum total of every single thing you do. And so the more you feel like you can't focus or don't need to focus on every single thing you do, the more you're losing all this percentage of like gunfight duels and um, rounds because you're letting it go. Like you're not focusing on it. You're not coordinating your teams on the buy rounds. You know, you're, you're losing all this EV, all this value because you feel like it's a little bit hopeless. At the end of the day, everything matters. And the idea that nothing matters uh, is a huge uh, crutch, I think. There's two things that kind of comes to mind with that is it really early on in my Valorant career, there was this guy named Ohai, former competitive player. I don't know if he still competes. I was watching a tournament of his really, really early on. This was like a really low level tournament and they were losing. And he was just saying like, play it like it's eight, eight, play it like it's round by round. That's, that really stuck with me. I know if we've talked about this before, I think by having that type of outlook mm -hmm. on the game, like, oh, I have to win this game or like, oh, I'm going to lose. Like try to look at it a round by round perspective and actually don't look too much at the scoreboard. Like, oh, you can observe it, but like, don't actually internalize it. Um, and the second thing is, and I don't know if it's super applicable to Valorant, but I don't know where the quote comes from, but I heard it. It was like in boxing, the outcome of the match is decided before you step into the ring, something like that. And I think the idea of that is like, whoever prepares the most before the match can come into the match with an advantage. And I think that is true for Valorant in the sense that if you've trained mechanically, if you've done the bot review, you have no reason to fear when you're winning or losing the game if you've come prepared. Um, and then you can just try to show up as your best self. Um, easier said than done, of course. But just know that if you have kind of done the prep work beforehand, it will eventually show up in the server. The next one, and this is from Super Positive Element. I want to shout out him, who's been, I think he's been a pretty long time supporter. I've seen a lot of your comments, so thank you for that. Uh, Super Positive Valorant asks, recently I've been struggling to find the motivation to play Valorant. My friends IRL don't have the same schedule as me and playing with randoms makes competitive not enjoyable. I find myself focusing on aim labs and working on my gun hygiene, lineups, and micro macro adjustments from VOD reviews and other YouTube content. As someone who's heavily invested in the community of content creation, I notice a lot of people leave comments being in a similar situation. I've heard several responses on how to help, but they're short-ended and leave a lot up to interpretation. Having a podcast like this would be a great time to touch upon numerous factors that goes into this mindset a large part of the community falls into. 
What are some practical tips and tricks in game and out of game to have a better approach to enjoying playing Valorant more as a solo queue? Oh man, I feel like I go through this journey a lot with not enjoying the game. So I will say number one, you're not alone. Um, as you said, you've seen comments like that so far. I don't actually think it's a bad thing to try to improve on the mechanical side of things because the reason why I play this game is to try to like feel a sense of progression. So I feel like you're kind of in the right track of what you're looking for when you play Valorant, like improving the mechanics, improving the aim side of things. I think maybe you have to kind of try to uh, do that progression for the game itself. Oh, maybe I need to improve on my comming or my teamwork, or like maybe I need to work on, I don't know, getting first bloods or maybe winning more executes. Like something that you can try to measure over the course of several games would be useful because you can do that just like, that's what you kind of do on aim labs. You can try to bring that sense of progression into Valorant. Um, like I said, a lot easier said than done. And I'm definitely in the same experience. For me, that sense of progression will kind of just be trying to push a new RR peak. So anything that is necessary for me to do so, I will try to do that. And then of course, looking back at my process, process and then going through that. So yeah, it's a very hard thing, but I know personally the most enjoyment I find out of the game is one, when my relationship with the game is very healthy. So I'm warming up, I'm playing my few ranked games, I'm doing my mechanics training, and then I just get off. So I don't play too much, it doesn't affect my game too much. And then by having a solid process like that, I inherently get new RR peaks. It's been like that ever since I started playing. The, the cleaner my process is and the more I stick to the routine, I always climb. It's like happened every single time without a doubt. And anytime I like take my gas, or my foot off of the gas and kind of just play to play, I start hating the game, I start performing worse, and I, you know, start losing RR. So yeah, that's just, hopefully that answers it from my experience. I think what you're kind of keying in on, uh, Adam, is that like, there's this book, Atomic Habits, and it talks about how kind of like, eventually, if you do something long enough, you become the thing. But the hack is to just pretend you're the thing and adopt the habits. So like, let's say you want to be a writer, you just... Would a writer every day or would a writer write every day? Of course they would. So if you just start writing every day, at some point you've become a writer, you know? What you're talking about is kind of if you were to adopt a pro process. So like imagine you played for a hundred thieves. What would your process look like? I mean, of course there's like scrims and practices and stuff like that. But you're probably working on your mechanics, probably taking care of your sleep. Um, you're probably not playing too many ranked games. If you adopt the process of a pro, eventually the good things will happen. When you just deeply need those good things to happen, they almost prevent them from happening. You know, like the uh, the advice that I've heard is that people want to be happy all the time, and so they just try to be happy. But being happy all the time often looks like just living for yourself. And if you just live for yourself all the time, eventually it's going to feel pretty empty. The advice they give is instead of trying to be happy, you just start to serve other people. And when you serve and help other people, you get happy. And so there's like a lot of things in life that you can't aim directly at. And I, and I think this might be one of them. The other one is, is similar to the, the other comp we had, which is just around mindset. Like, how are you approaching the game? Adam, you and I were talking about early this week. There was a, uh, or maybe it was last week. There was a, uh, a newsletter I sent you around mindset and how a bunch of housekeepers, they told these housekeepers that the physical activity they were going to do all day was beneficial for their health. And then they checked in with the ones they told this to and the ones they didn't tell this to. And the ones they told uh, that this was going to be beneficial to their health, they actually lost weight. They lowered their blood pressure. They did more work, I think. And um, they lowered their, like, I think it's the, the waist to hip ratio. The way they were approaching the work changed the effect of the work on them. The way you approach Valorant is going to change its effect on you. Um, are you using it as a self-worth and validation? Then the wins and the losses are going to feel pretty heavy. If you are using it as a display of all the work you've done, I think it's going to be a much healthier relationship. Um, and my, my last point would be, Notice what's the difference between your really enjoyable games versus your really unenjoyable games. For Adam, his biggest things, I think, are increasing RR. But maybe your biggest joys are when you get to IGL the way to win. 
maybe your biggest things are when you create a creative strategy on the way to a win, or maybe the, the worst games are when you tilt. So just notice the difference between the games you really enjoy and the ones you don't, and think about how you can have a mindset that will do more of the things you enjoy and try to reduce the uh, impact of the games that you don't enjoy. Well said. So Adam, what are your thoughts on winner's queue and loser's queue? Um, does this phenomenon, ph phenomenon exist? Is Riot Games really out to get you and cause you to lose your games uh, by putting you in a loser's queue? Yeah, so when I get this question, I um, my immediate question to fire back is, even if it were true, does it matter? And I don't know if it's true or not. I think there was like some type of thing with League of Legends. It's probably not true. Um, but again, even if it were true, knowing that, would that help you? No, right? So you shouldn't even entertain the thought, in my opinion. Um, when you have these streaks, try to take responsibility on it, right? So if you're doing really well, like maybe you are playing well, is your process looking good? Are you getting good teammates? Are, are your energy levels good? Like try to, you know, take some positive takeaways from that. And then same and vice versa. If you're having a really bad streak, like are, is your, are you getting tilted or like you letting those things affect you? It's a snowball effect, right? If you're doing really well, all the positive things will snowball. If you're doing really poorly, all the negative things will snowball. And just try to look at, at it objectively. And that, you know, that goes back to the quote I was talking about earlier, where when you're winning, you're not as good as you think you are. When you're losing, you're not as bad as you think you are. Try to really, I guess, keep that in mind and don't feed into the cup too much. They, it just does not serve you in any capacity. So, yeah. I think it's 100% cope. Um, Riot Games, the whole ranked queue is intended, the whole thing is intended to match you against similarly ranked players, which is why, you know, if, when you play long enough, you aren't rolling every game uh, and you aren't getting rolled every game. And that's because it's pretty smart at understanding the collective um, impact that each player has and then ranking them accordingly. It's actually like a really beautifully elegant system. Um, if you think it's winner's queue or loser's queue, at some level, you're kind of thinking it's like riot out to get you. And it's an algorithm. Is your YouTube algorithm out to get you? Is your is your TikTok algorithm out to get you? No, it's just it's just that is meant to grab your attention. The Riot Games algorithm is meant to appropriately pair you with players. Some, some games are way out of whack. You're going to have a Smurf. There's nothing around that. Sometimes you're going to have an AFK and there's really nothing around that either. Uh, but the whole thing is meant to have reasonably competitive games. And on average, that's what happens. So I think this is not a useful mindset. And, and it, it's the reason it is uh, sexy. The reason it is compelling is it because it it gives this kind of ulterior motive. Conspiracy theories are really attractive because it kind of helps explain things. But ultimately, I think it's really attractive because it takes the responsibility from you to them. And I think what Adam is pointing at is the way for you to really improve is for you to take that radical responsibility for yourself. So that that's our answer on winners and losers queue. It's it's a fairly strong and definitive one. Um, and, and I think it's true. Um, and I think it's reflective. I don't know how to pronounce this name. Hungul Doi. Um, do you have any content creators in mind for future collaboration or even with some pros to share their thoughts and their lives? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely want to collab with a few people. Um, I think it would be really cool to have some pros in the space. I personally would like to talk to Zekin just because I'm a, a Zekin fanboy. Yeah, Zekin, if you someone reach out to Zekin and we'd have him on this podcast in a in a hot minute. Yes. One congrats to him and his team for qualifying for for Masters Madrid. I mean, I think with all of the the hate that Tens received over the last couple of years, like it's so cool to see that team succeeding. They seem like really good people and and I think it'd be cool to see them really just come into their own because that team is like on fire on off of that note. I'm it's actually incredible to see specifically tens do the role swap because like it, there's a lot to say that I think it's better to play the role that you're comfortable in versus the one that you, people force you into be, because sure. it sounds like from what I've heard with tens is like when he played duelist, there was just so much pressure on him to do well and he didn't like it. And like now that he's playing that support support role, 
there's so much pressure off of him. He can kind of just perform and it's, it's showing on the server. I mean, that kid is incredible. I, I say kid, he's like a full grown adult, but he's, he's incredible. So that's just something I'm curious about is like, how do people like select their roles? And, um, yeah, so I would love to collab with Zach and kind of just have his discussions on that. And, uh, another one that comes to mind is obviously Wahoojin. We love Wahoojin, obviously a huge content creator in the space. And I think he's had like a very systematic approach in growing in uh, the space. And specifically, he loves the incremental growth on improvement in general. So I think it kind of aligns with uh, how we approach the game in improving. Comment in here was like Hujin Tarek. I mean, like, yeah, of course, Hujin. Definitely, you've done a lot of collabs with him. Uh, Tarek, that'd be pretty cool, too. Uh, So if anyone wants to shout out Tarek. I think the other one for me that comes to mind is DDK. Uh, we've reached out to him in the past. Um, probably going to have um, some people from Adamas um, on the performance psychology. They do a lot of cool work with teams uh, to help prep teams to to perform better as a team, but also to to mentally prep as well. So I think it'd be cool to have uh, Coach Ryan from their team on as well. He's right now coaching Fanatic on the performance side. Um, those are the ones that come to mind for me. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a... Uh, specifically on the performance coach side, I think there's a huge need for it. Um, and I mean, there's just, there's a huge gap in the gaming space that I think needs to be addressed by performance coaches. So I would love to do that episode. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of benefit or value to be had from there. Yeah, I think you can notice how much your mental affects your the quality of your play. And, and I'm sure people have noticed how the mental affects the your teammates as well. You know, how many how many people raise your hand? I'm, there's a, there will be a lot of people have had someone FF after like you lose your pistol. Like it's like there's a lot of Valorant left to be played. And yet some people feel like if it doesn't go perfectly, there's no point going. Um, and so the, the mental piece is really fragile, which means that if you improve your mental, like that's a huge leg up. Highly agree. That's like the edge. That's the edge that you'll have over your opponents. Those are all the questions. Thanks to everyone for sending these in. This was uh, a really fun episode. We're so excited about where the podcast is going. So thank you for your support. Adam and I were talking about this. There's a there was a uh, a report around most podcasts don't even make it to three episodes. Uh, the, it's the top one percent of podcasts that have more than twenty episodes. So by the time we finish all of the deep dives of the maps, which we have fine split freeze and Lotus left, I'm surprised I remembered that off the top of my head. We'll be in the top 1% of podcasts, which is pretty cool. We will be an immortal podcast because immortal is the top 1% of Valorant. So that's pretty cool. Thank you everyone for your support. It's been super exciting. Uh, Icebox just dropped today and next week we will put out a community post for the next deep dive. So until then, Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we really appreciate all of the love and the support. Appreciate it. Peace out.